Let me read this, this is John chapter four, starting in verse three. It says, Jesus left Judea and went away again to Galilee, and he had to pass through Samaria. So he came to a city of Samaria called Sychar, near the parcel of land that Jacob gave to his son Joseph. And Jacob's well was there. So Jesus, tired from his journey, was just sitting by the well. It was about the sixth hour, which would have been about noon, middle of the day. Verse seven, it says, a woman, notice it just, there's no name, just a woman of Samaria came to draw water. Jesus said to her, give me a drink. For his disciples had gone away to the city to buy food, so the Samaritan woman said to him, how is it that you, though you are a Jew, are asking me for a drink, though I am a Samaritan woman? For Jews do not associate with Samaritans. Jesus replied to her, if you knew the gift of God and who it is who is saying to you, give me a drink, you would have asked him and he would have given you living water. She said to him, sir, you have no bucket and the well is deep. Where then do you get this living water? You are not greater than our father Jacob, are you? Who gave us the well and drank of it himself and his sons and his cattle? Jesus answered and said to her, everyone who drinks of this water will be thirsty again. But whoever drinks of the water that I will give them shall never be thirsty. But the water that I give, will give them will become in him a fountain of water springing up to eternal life. Then she said to him, sir, give me this water so that I will not be thirsty, nor come all the way here to draw water. He said to her, go, call your husband and come here. The woman answered and said to him, I have no husband. Jesus said to her, you have correctly said, I have no husband. For you have had five husbands and the one whom you now have is not your husband. This which you have said is true. I just imagine that's a little bit of an awkward moment in this conversation. The woman said to him, sir, I perceive that you are a prophet. He's gotta be something. <laughs> Our fathers worshiped on this mountain and yet you Jews say that in Jerusalem is the place where one must worship. Jesus said to her, believe me woman, that a time is coming when you will worship the father neither on this mountain nor in Jerusalem. There was, there was debate between the Samaritans and the Jews that where the actual place was supposed to be where they could worship their heavenly father and uh, Jesus arriving and going to the cross and being resurrected from the tomb allows that to happen anywhere. But there was debate in this day of where that could actually happen. That's what she's speaking into. And he says, you Samaritans worship what you do not know. We worship what we do know because salvation is from the Jews. But a time is coming even now has, and even now has arrived when the true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and truth. For such people, the Father seeks to be his worshipers. God is spirit and those who worship him must worship in spirit and truth. The woman said to him, I know that Messiah is coming, he who is called Christ. When the one that comes, he will declare all things to us. Jesus said to her, and this might be the most crucial three words in this passage. I am he, the one speaking to you. And that moment, I believe, changes everything for this woman, and we're gonna see that tonight. At this point, the disciples show back up and they're like, man, what in the world? Jesus is talking to Samaritan. And then in verse 29, it says, come see a man. The, the, in verse 28, it says, so the woman left her water pot, went to the city and said to the people, come see a man who told me all the things that I have done. This is not the Christ, is he? They left the city and were coming to him. And then if you skip down to verse 39, it says, now from the city, many of the Samaritans believed in him because of the word of the woman who testified. Let's pray. God, would you use this passage tonight to speak something to us that we cannot dismiss, that we can't walk out of here and not consider? God, I pray that your word would be alive and it would be active in our lives tonight. We ask that of you. Right now, just ask God to show you something. Maybe you're never, you've never really even been involved in church, but what have you got to lose? Ask God to show you something tonight. And pray for the person on your right. Pray that God would show him or her something tonight. Pray for the person on your left, same thing. Just ask God to show that person, him or her, something rich, something life-changing. And then lastly, pray for me, that I would be able to just communicate whatever God wants us to hear tonight. God, we trust you. We pray for this time in Jesus' name. Amen. 
Hey, just sit down, look at uh, the people maybe you just prayed for and just say, hey, it's good to see you. Welcome to Church Story. I didn't say make friends. <laughs> but that's okay, that's good. I'm glad that, that uh, that's how that works out. When you hear the word flipped, what is the first thing that comes to mind? Hold that thought. What's the second thing that comes to mind? Some of you need to just go ahead and go to number two on that, okay? What's the second thing that comes to mind? I heard burgers. Somebody yelled out burgers. That's a good one. Everybody likes a good burger. A trampoline. All right, that's good. Somebody right here. Wilson? Wilson. Man, I'm lo you lost me on that one. I'm going to have to come back and figure out. I'm, now I'm curious. Uh, somebody else, raise your hand so I can see you. I want to hear uh, right over here. Flip the channel. All right, that's good. Um, flip the channel. Right back here, back row. Light switch. All right, light switch flips on and off. Houses, flipping houses. Hey, it's our shake weight friend in the back. Landon, if you missed last week, you don't know what I'm talking about, but Landon. Tires, all right, flipping tires, that sounds terrible. He's, a, he's graduated from the shake weight to flipping tires. I like it, I like it. I heard something right up here. Flexible, all right, you gotta be flexible to flip, especially tires. All right, that's good. Some other things I thought of was pancakes. You gotta flip some pancakes. Um, some people just flip out. Um, anybody done that this week? <laughs> All right, we got some hands going up. I like the honesty. Relentlessly transparent at Church Story. I love it. Here's, a, here's why I want you to think about it. We're in a series called Flip the Script, and when I think about the word flipped, it's a word that is, I think, a, it's got action to it. It's intense. You know, if I said flower, nobody's like, ooh, that's intense, you know? Uh, flipped, though, there's, like, there's action to it. In most instances, in almost every situation that was mentioned or every specific item that was mentioned, when that is flipped, there's a drastic change that takes place post-flip. I mean, you flip a house, you completely change a house. You flip a burger, well, the other side of the burger is gonna cook. It's gonna change. Same with a pancake. When things flip, things change, and that's what we've been looking at. That's been the point of the series is looking at the lives of Ordinary people like you and me in the Bible that specifically had an encounter with Jesus, and in that encounter, a change took place. There was, the, there was a flip, something happened, something was different in the days ahead. And tonight, I want us to look at the story of the woman at the well that we just read, and I want us to begin to understand some things that I think are true for all of us as we encounter Jesus, the, ch the change that Jesus does in us. And so tonight, I wanna talk specifically about the relentless pursuit for the restless soul. Um, if you're looking for titles and you're taking notes, you can write that down, The Relentless Pursuit for the Restless Soul. And let me give you a little bit of a preview. Uh, we're gonna see three things flip here tonight. The first thing we're gonna see is we're gonna see uncertainty flip to clarity. And then we're gonna see comparison flips to completion. And then we're gonna see, wait for it, condemnation flipped to celebration. And you're like, Wes, that was way too fast. I can't write that fast. Don't worry, we're gonna come back to all those. You're gonna have plenty of time to write, I promise. Um, but let's look at that first one. First one, I, I just said, I think when I was studying this passage this week and looking through it, uh, there were a handful of things that stuck out to me that I think are true for a lot of us. We all wrestle with these, men and women. I think we can wrestle with these things in different ways, but I think there's some specific hangups that we see in the life of the woman at the well that every single one of us can find ourselves in at certain times out of our life, maybe for the majority of our life, even. The first one is uncertainty. It's just this, this uncertainty of what's going on. Why is this happening? Why am I in this conversation? Why am I in this situation? Uh, men, let me ask you this question. Has, have any of you ever been driving down the road, you and your wife, you and your girlfriend, you know, you and your, just your friend, girl, I don't know what else you want to call it, uh, driving down the road and you get about 10 minutes from the house and there's like this panic moment, like, <gasps> Like in that moment, you don't know if there's like a meteor falling from the sky or if uh, she just left the Kleenexes in her other purse. I mean, it could, be, it could be anything in between there. But she says something like this, I think I left my straightener on or maybe curling iron on. Anybody ever had that experience? You've been driving on the road and, all right, all right, two people. All right, all right, so this is, uh, this is going well. 
My wife and I, actually, it's, it's really funny in our house because she'll text me once every couple of weeks and she'll say, I think I left my straightener on. And I'm telling you, 100% of the time that she's actually texted, thinking that she left it on, she's never actually left it on. But the days that she doesn't think to text, thinking that she left it on, it's been left on. It's really funny how that works. But there's this uncertainty in that situation, and we've all had those, those different moments. And I think that's a little bit ridiculous, but that's a little bit what's going on for this woman. She's stuck in this place of uncertainty. She's having a conversation with a Jewish man. That's a massive, like, no-no. This is not supposed to happen. In this situation, we see that Jesus had to go through Samaria, which he didn't really have to. There were other ways to get to Galilee from Judea, but Jesus had to go through Samaria because I think he had to have this encounter with this woman. And it wasn't just about this conversation. This is a divine encounter that's taking place. But I think specifically for this woman, she's struggling with understanding why is this happening? Why, why is this man talking to me? But then I think even to reflect on, as, as the conversation continues on, she's having this conversation with this man who tells her things about her that are true and really awkward and uncomfortable to talk about in public, and then he claims to be the Messiah. And I've got to imagine in that moment where he says, I am he, this is a moment that changes everything for her, but there's a tendency, I think, in each of us that when we think about God himself speaking to me, there are times where I'm uncertain that God would ever really speak to me. I mean, you see this in, all the way in the very beginning, Adam and Eve, when the serpent shows up on the scene, the enemy shows up and he looks at Eve and he begins to tell her, he says, did God really say this? It's like, this is the common tactic of the enemy. Did God really say? And I'm sure that Eve's thinking, well, I'm pretty sure that he said. I mean, I think that he said that. I think the same thing can happen for us as we begin to think about, well, God's speaking, or I think, I think God's showing me something I should do, but is he, is he really saying that? Is he, did God really say that? Did God really say that to me? Because I know that he's probably said that to other people, but would he say it to me? And if you think about this woman, she's probably thinking, well, why would this man be having a conversation with me? I'm not worthy of this conversation. Not only did, is it asking a question, would God really say that, but why would God say that to me? Like, I'm not qualified to hear from God. Surely God knows everything I've ever done, and so if I consider all the things that are going on in my life, I'm not sure that I could ever actually hear from God. I'm not sure that God would ever really speak to me. You see, this woman had a reputation, okay? This was a, this was a shady lady. She's struggling with her past, and she's probably wrestling with her present circumstances, and I think we can all find, we can, we can find ourselves in the same place where we're haunted by the things that have happened in our past and maybe even the things we're currently participating in. And I think it forces us to ask the question when I think about this is, would God really speak to me with where I've been and with where I currently am? And I think the story gives us some confidence. We'll look at that in just a second. But not only is she probably wrestling with some uncertainty, like why is this man having a conversation with me, this man who ends up to be God in the flesh, fully God, fully human, but I think she's also wrestling with some comparison. And why do I know that? Well, she's coming to the well to draw water in the heat of the day. This would be like living in Houston and going and looking for water in the heat of the day when she could have gone earlier in the morning. But that's when everybody else goes and finds water. And for some reason, she doesn't wanna be there when everybody else is there. So she's struggling with this comparison. Ladies, have you um, ever said something like this? And, and I'm not gonna ask the guys because I just don't even wanna... Yeah, I don't wanna do this to you. Because <laughs> um, women are better at verbalizing things than we are. Men, we just internalize. We just hold it in, even when we're thinking it sometimes. But ladies, have you ever made the statement to a friend, to your spouse, and you've said something like, oh my gosh, she is so pretty. Or maybe, she is, she is so skinny. Oh my gosh, she is like the perfect woman. Anybody bold enough to say, I, I've made a statement like that about somebody, I'm not, I'm ashamed of you, okay? I, I've, heard, I've heard women say that, so, um, and listen, fellas, just a word of advice, like in that moment, if she says that to you, that's just, that's just a moment to just keep your mouth shut, right? <laughs> There's no win. There's no win in that situation. I think it actually says in Hesitations chapter two, verse six, <laughs> that the only time it's okay to lie to your spouse is when it's about a potential attractive person. <laughs> But I think in this moment, what you see is you see this comparison. And I think 
I think, I think ladies can, can maybe verbalize this a little bit more than men do, but I think men do it just as much. We begin to think, you know, I'm, I'm not as pretty or I'm not as skinny or I'm not as smart, I'm not as strong, I'm not as successful, I'm, I'm, just, not, I'm just not enough. And I think this is what she's, she's wrestling with. She's in this place where she's struggling with who she is. And the result of that is she is avoiding being in places where there's people that she th- thinks are better than her. And she finds herself in a place of isolation. And she's choosing to stay in this place. And I think for some of us, we can find ourselves in the same place. We can begin, begin to think things like, I'm not, I'm not good enough or I'm not smart enough, I'm not, I'm not valuable enough that, that it would be worth somebody spending time with me in a romantic relationship or, um, and I, I've, I've, I've joked about this before, but maybe this, we're coming up on Valentine's Day, so let's just jump on in. Um, Valentine's Day is coming up. And that can be a challenging time for someone who doesn't have a special significant other in a romantic relationship. It, it becomes Single Awareness Day. And so you, you're in this place and it's like you start to actually compare because social media like fuels this. You start to look at all, everybody else seems to have someone and you desire to be in a relationship with someone. And listen, that's okay. It's also okay to not desire to be in a relationship with someone. It actually says you're better off to not marry someone. All right, don't amen that, okay? Especially if you're married tonight. Uh, but the Bible does say that. Um, my wife is a great counselor though. If you need some help, we can, we can figure that out. Um, but maybe that's where you are. You're just, it, it overwhelms you. You're like, man, I just, I, I, really, I really desire to be with someone. Here's the problem is there's times where that comparison, when we see what other people have and we see that we don't have that, we begin to cut corners. We begin to justify actions. We begin to do things that we said we would never do. And the challenge, the, the danger in that is we begin to rob ourselves of the life that God ultimately wants for us. Here's what I mean by that. Let's say that you're the single And you're like, man, I'm getting older. You know, I'm gonna be by myself forever. And you start to kind of panic about that a little bit. And that's a real thing. And then you begin to lower your standards. You're like, well, I just just need to be with somebody because somebody's better than nobody. And so you start this cycle of lowering your standards and spending time with people that really aren't who you need to be spending time with. It's not God's best for you, but you justify it because you think, well, I'm just not worth anybody else. So I'm just gonna go with this. And then you find yourself in a cycle of unhealthy relationship after unhealthy relationship after unhealthy relationship and eventually get to a place, even if all those relationships are in the rearview mirror, you've begun to carry baggage from each one of those and you carry it with you into the next relationship. And that's not what God wants for you. And there's healing and there's restoration that can take place. But when we find ourselves in a place of comparison, this is where we often can find ourselves. I had somebody randomly ask me this question a couple weeks ago, and I don't even really know where it came from because it was actually a dude that asked me this question. And he said, hey, Wes, can, can Christians wear makeup? I was like, I, yeah, I think so. I mean, man, if you wanna wear makeup, dab it on, put it on. And you know, some people maybe need it more. I don't know, I don't, just you do you. But here's the challenge. And then the question went on further and he said, what about plastic surgery? Is plastic surgery okay for Christians? And you're like, oh, Wes, what are you about to say? I don't know. Um, I, th- I think, can you afford it? Okay, then do it. But be careful. Well, first of all, if you can't afford it, don't do it. I don't know what the repossession process looks like in a situation <laughs> like that. <laughs> that sounds messy. <laughs> but be careful. Because what happens is, is if the motivation is because you feel like you're not good enough, you're not pretty enough, you're not attractive enough, and you think, well, if I do this, then there's always gonna be somebody that's prettier. There's always gonna be somebody who's more attractive. And so you have to be careful what's motivating what you do. And if what's motivating is this comparison trap that you found yourself in, it's a really dangerous place to find yourself. This is where this woman is stuck. And maybe that's not your situation. You're like, Wes, I'm not, I've never worried about makeup, plastic surgery, any of those things. But maybe this is this idea for you where maybe it's I'm not a good enough parent. You look at the life of your kids and you think, man, I just I don't know that I've done the job that I'm supposed to do. I remember when my boys were younger and I used, we used to take them to a uh, weekday preschool um, at St. John's Lutheran here in Cyprus. And man, there were some mornings where it was like easy peasy. It was so easy getting them ready for school and getting them uh, to, to, the, to the, 
where they needed to be and they're dressed and they're matching and their hair's done just right, their lunch is packed perfectly. And then there were those mornings where they're like, let's make dad's life miserable today. And it just was crazy chaos. And, it's, and, and there were moments I literally would drop the boys off and like walking back to my truck, I, I was like playing Eye of the Tiger in my head. Like I won the day because they survived and they're there. And then as I'm walking in, I see other like moms and dads walking their kids in and it's just like they're all perfect and proper and neat. I mean, some of you show up to church like that. You're like, man, you're, you look at that family like, man, they've just got it together. Like what is their secret? Benadryl. <laughs> That's what I've convinced myself of. It's Benadryl. And you laugh because you've thought that. You've at least had the thought. <laughs> That's why you're laughing. You've had the same thought. You're like, I, I'm desperate. I've got to do something with these kids. But here, here's, here's why I say that. Because I think sometimes it's funny when they're younger and it is just a mess. And it's like, you know what? Some days they just need to look homeless and that's okay. <laughs> but here's, here's what can happen sometimes. We can begin to carry that mindset as they get older. And it's not just about how they look, it's about the decisions they begin to make, it's about the lives that they continue to live, and you begin to think to yourself, man, I'm just, I just wasn't a good enough parent, I'm not a good parent. And you begin to feel the weight and the regret of maybe I should have done something different. And I just, I just want you to consider this as you think about it, because I don't think that's always your fault, and even if it is your fault, consider this, is God a good parent? Is God a good father? Yes. Are his children always good? No. no. But does that make him a bad parent? No. So give yourself a break. Give yourself some grace. And stop carrying something that you're not supposed to be carrying because you're looking at everybody else and you think that they've got it going on. And a lot of times, because we're looking at social media and we see the billboard of everybody's life, not the diary or the journal. And we begin to judge ourselves based on what we see. We fall into this comparison trap. Give yourself some grace. I think you see this with this woman. Not only is she wrestling with the uncertainty and the comparison, but I think you see her wrestling with condemnation. I mean, you can imagine being this woman. She's in this place where she's living uh, with shame and probably regrets. Feels like I'm picking on, on my wife a little bit tonight, and I'm not. Um, she knows what she signed up for by <laughs> marrying a pastor. Um, but there's been times, and I don't know if this ever happens in your house, but Brandy will say to me sometimes, um, hey, I gotta go run some errands. All right, cool, where are you going? Uh, just a couple places. Uh, I'm gonna stop by Walmart. I'm gonna drop some things off that I need to return. I'm like, okay, cool. A few hours later, she shows back up at the house and she's got like bags in her hands. <laughs> and she's just smiling, you know, looking all cute and pretty. She's like, what? It was, what? On sale. On sale. You know, <laughs> like, you, it happens to you too. It was on sale. It's always on sale. And I remember there was a time a couple of years ago where I don't even remember what I said. I don't know what face I made, but I know sometimes my face communicates something I didn't intend to communicate. I don't know if you have that problem, but I do sometimes. And she, um, she took a lot of that stuff back. And I remember asking her a couple of days, I don't even remember what the item was, but I asked her, I said, hey, what, what did you do with that? And she said, well, I, I took it all back because you were like disappointed that I bought all that stuff, and I felt terrible about that. I was like, I'm so sorry. I'm gonna, I'm gonna clean the house every day this week. I'm gonna mop the floors. I'm gonna sleep on the couch if I need to sleep on the couch. Like, whatever I need. Like, I felt bad about that, but here's, here's why I tell you that story. That's a ridiculous story, but there's times where we start to feel bad, and we start to carry that shame. We start to carry that con condemnation in our lives, and it begins to impact our lives, and it begins to, to leave us in this place beneath God's will for our lives, not because you went shopping, okay? That was a ridiculous example, but I think we can all understand what it's like to live in a place of condemnation. And I think there's a, there's a movement that can be made. This woman feels that. She can sense that in her life. And she has this encounter on this particular day with a man named Jesus who is the Messiah. And I think the, the game changer verse, the game changer that flips the, the uncertainty, that flips the comparison, that flips the condemnation is what we read in verse 26 that I told you to highlight, to underline. I wanna go back to it. It says, Jesus said to her, right after she asked, is this the Messiah? Are you the chosen one? She, she had an understanding. She was anticipating the arrival of this Jesus. But she wasn't sure if this is who that was. And then Jesus says to her, I am he, and I think it's in this moment that everything changes. Everything changes in her life. You begin to, and you see her response. You see how she begins to operate different. But here's what's interesting. Here's what I want us to see. This woman comes to this well, 
And I think it's a picture of her life. She's coming back to something over and over and over, looking for satisfaction, looking for something that she's hoping to find. For her, it's, it's the well of broken relationships. And we don't know why this, I mean, I, I called her a shady lady, lady a little while ago, which is probably incredibly disrespectful because I don't know her story. I don't know if this is a life that she chose for herself. I mean, maybe, maybe this was something that she chose and these were, these were relationships that uh, she participated in the dysfunction, they just didn't work out, but maybe it was something that was chosen for her. Maybe she was in a place where she was just the object of everyone else's satisfaction and that's just what she had learned to just be and that's all that she thought she would ever be. We don't, we don't really know, but we know that she continues to come back to this well. This was interesting. If you go back and you start reading in Genesis and a little bit into Exodus, Several people in Genesis and Exodus find the love of their lives at a well. When you go back to Genesis, you can read about Isaac. Isaac finds his wife at a well. Jacob finds his wife at a well. Moses finds his wife at a well, Exodus chapter two. Here's what's interesting. They found the love of their life, their beloved, at the well. So here we have this woman who's been living this life and we don't know exactly why or how she ended up in this place. And all of a sudden, she has this encounter with Jesus. She didn't go looking for him. He went after her. He pursued her. He had to go to Samaria. And I think in this moment, this is where we see him begin to change the uncertainty, and he flips it into clarity. She begins to see. She begins to understand. She begins to, to, to see what's going on in a little bit different way in this situation. Because we see that she's avoided everyone. She's showing up in the middle of the day because no one else is gonna be there. She arrives this day and Jesus is sitting there and it's kinda like, I thought she'd be here. Like this has gotta be a little bit uncomfortable for this woman, we sense that. But I want us to understand what Jesus does. Jesus steps across cultural barriers. Jesus was a Jew, she was a Samaritan. These are two people groups that don't mix. There was an incredible prejudice between the, Jamer the, the Jamaritans, the Jews and the Samaritans. And Jesus says, you know what, I don't care about the cultural barriers. I mean, in this moment, what Jesus should have done when a Samaritan woman began to approach him at this well is what he should have done is he should have gotten up and walked off. No eye contact, no acknowledgement, and just completely dismissed himself from the scene. But he doesn't do that. He sits there and he engages with her. He has a conversation with her because he was pursuing her. This is a picture of the story for all of us because Jesus does this for every single one of us. Her story is my story, her story is your story. It's why we've been in the series Flip the Script every single week, we've been seeing this, we've seen ourselves in these stories. And I think as we launch into a new church story, more than anything, I want us to have a clear understanding of who Jesus is and who he wants to be for us because I think you see radical change happen in our lives as we begin to recognize that he was continually pursuing you, and he continues to pursue you. He did this with this woman. You see him do this all the way in the very beginning, in the book of Genesis. Adam and Eve, they fall in the garden, and they begin to run, and they go hide, and what does Jesus do? He goes looking for them. Cain, after he takes his brother's life, he runs from God. What does God do? He goes looking for him. God continually pursues us. I remember when my boys were really, really little, we used to play hide and seek. And you know if you played hide and seek with like a three-year-old, it's really easy. <laughs> There's not a lot of energy or intelligence required uh, to be successful. I'll never forget one time walking into my closet in our house and we, I was playing hide and go seek with both the boys and I walk in and they're both sitting in our closet right behind my clothes which are on the lower rack and so I can see their feet sticking out. And I can see the clothes moving and I can hear them in there whispering and breathing and I'm like, hey Brandy, are you know if the boys are in the closet? And she's like, I don't know. <laughs> she's like, what are you doing? I was like, I don't, I don't know if I can find them. And then I was like, hey, hey boys, are y'all in here? Brayden, are you in here? No. <laughs> and I'm like, I was like, I, I don't, man, I don't, are you sure you're not in here? Uh-huh. <laughs> I'm like, uh, Brandy, I don't think they're in the, I don't think they're in here. And I tell you that story because it's ridiculous, but I think that's, that's what we try to do. Like, we can't hide from God, but we work real hard to try to hide from God because we feel like, you know what, there's no way he would wanna have a relationship with me. There's no way he would wanna interact with me. There's no way he would come after me. And yet God comes after us anyways. It's why he sent 
Jesus. We see this demonstrated in this story. He pursues this woman. There was nothing that she had done to earn it or to deserve it, but he pursued her anyways. And I think that it's important for some of us to see tonight because I believe that there may be one, two, three, 20, 40 people here tonight that you've disqualified yourself from hearing from God. And this is a reminder to you that there's nothing you've done, there's nothing you are going to do, and there's nothing that you have to do in order for God to pursue you. He chooses you, he chooses to pursue you regardless of what you do. And we see this in the story with this woman. It's the reason we've been doing this whole story. Why does this matter? You know, there are times in my life where I can be sitting by myself, and it's, 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 it's scary because this happens in times where I think we're the most disconnected from people. There was a week, a couple weeks ago, where I just, I, man, it was just a lot to do, and it, it required a lot of time and a lot of my energy by myself to accomplish a lot of things that needed to be accomplished, and so I just didn't have a lot of interaction with people that week, and it kind of put me into this funk. I'm like, man, I gotta get out. I gotta hang out with people. I'm an extrovert. I like to, I like to spend time with people, but it's some of those moments I can begin to think to myself, man, I'm a mess. Like, God, you really, you really want to choose me to do this? God, I'm not qualified. God, if people, if people knew some of the thoughts and some of the doubts and some of the concerns that I have, like what, it, would, it, what, I don't, it doesn't make sense. God, what, what in the world? Like I think my mind goes to the place where this woman's mind might have been. Like there's no reason for God to speak to me. There's no reason that God needs me. There's no reason that God wants to use me. There's no reason that God would pursue me. And yet he chooses to anyways. And I think this is what the story reminds me of. And just a minute ago, I, I made light of parenting and I, I joked a little bit about that, but I, I think for some of us, even maybe if it's not you, because I think in those moments where I find myself in that place, there's always this realization, you know what, he's coming after me and he's pulling me out anyways. And it gives me confidence to clearly see who he is and who he sees me as. It's as his child. But I think it's a significant reminder for us tonight, maybe in a little bit different context. Because maybe you're a parent here tonight and you are overwhelmed with concern for your child because your child is continuing to make decisions that are self-destructive, and there's this pattern of behavior that you have watched over and over and over, and you think, man, what in the world is gonna happen? God, are you paying attention? God, do you care? God, do you love him? And I think what this clearly shows us is that he is deeply concerned, that he loves your child deeply. He loves him or her more than you could ever love him or her. And there's going to be a time where he's going to meet him or her at their well. And so it's easy for us to get really overwhelmed, but when we get overwhelmed, we've gotta go back to this and say, you know what? If God loves me that much, then he loves him that much and he loves her that much. And it doesn't matter where they're at, God will find them, God will continue to pursue them. It might be in a hotel room, it might be in a bar, it might be in a stranger's bed, it might be with a needle in their arm, but there is no place that they will go that is off limits from God's pursuit for them because he loves them and it gives me hope and it gives me confidence to never stop having hope for my children. I think for some of us, we've gotta run and remember that because it can completely paralyze our minds when we think about the reality of the life that a child might be living, and I think that we can attach our hope to this, but not only does he flip uncertainty into clarity, he flips comparison into completion. I love what this does, I love the picture of what we see in this. It's significant to John, the number seven. There's a couple of different things in the book of John that land at the number seven. There were seven major miracles described in the book of John. There's seven I am statements that are referenced in the book of John. John, when he wrote the book of Revelation, he talks about the seven churches because seven is the number of completion. And so you see this show up. And this woman is having this encounter with Jesus. He says, okay, you've had five husbands. Well, I'm not a, a rocket scientist. Um, I, I went to public school, and so, uh, but I do know this, that five, you're like, why are you cracking on public school? I'm just being ridiculous. Um, five plus one equals Six, I'm just, let me try that again. Five plus one equals, all right, all right. Five plus one equals six. Well, six is the number of incompletion. And you're like, well, what? That, that's different from 666, six, six, the mark of the beast. That's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about the number six is, is the number that stands for being incomplete. Jesus shows up. And obviously, this woman has missed the relationship teaching series at church. 
and she's in this pattern of dysfunction and Jesus shows up and he says, you've had five husbands and the one you're with now is actually not your husband, but the one who will complete you is now here. And you see he's the seventh one, it is completion. He completes her. And she's been working her whole life to try to find that satisfaction, to find what makes her feel complete. And Jesus pursues her and he says, I'm, I'm here. I am he. And he flips the script of her comparison because she's been so focused on everybody else and how she stands up to everybody else in her life. And it pushes her to a place where she isolates and disconnects because she doesn't feel worthy. And Jesus shows up and he says, I'm here and I had to come here because I had to have an encounter with you. I want to know you, I love you, I care about you. I don't know where you're at, but when I read this, I, I often have had this thought, like, but Jesus, then why, if you love her so much, like why did you shame her? Like you totally just called her out. Like you got all her dirty laundry and you just threw it out there for everybody to see. I think there's a couple things we can see in this. Jesus has this encounter with her in a loving, confrontational way. He doesn't do this in front of a big group of people. He's not exposing her for any personal gain for himself. He's having a honest dialogue with her. And oftentimes I think we miss, we, 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 want the, we wanna have the, the encounter with Jesus. We want the love, we want the grace, we want the mercy. We want Jesus to be for us. But I think what we see here is that when, when you begin to encounter Jesus, you know Jesus, and Jesus makes us complete, we don't have to focus on the comparison anymore because he makes us complete. And we get to operate from that place of completion. But oftentimes what that means is that when we encounter him, and we began to know him, it requires some change, it requires some adjustment, not to be accepted, but because he has something better for you. And so as we encounter Jesus, there's this humility that begins to be required. And in that humility, we begin to find healing for ourselves and for the patterns and for the, the behaviors and the things that are bringing the dysfunction in our lives, Jesus begins to heal and restore those things. One of the verses that a lot of people like to use is that if God is for me, then who could be against me? But I think what we see here is that there are times where God will oppose you. Not because he doesn't love you, but because he does love you. His relentless love requires that he oppose some of the things going on in our lives. That's why you parents, you love your children. The same love that drives you to hug and to kiss and to, to comfort and to care for your children is the same love that you use to protect them and keep them from doing things that are gonna bring destruction in their lives. And we see the same thing with God. God wants something good for us. His relentless love does this for us. So there's times where God's love exposes areas of darkness in our life. Why? Because he has something better. And until that darkness has been exposed, we can't live in the freedom that he gave his life for. I remember when I was in college, every single Tuesday night after breakaway in College Station, we would go eat 50 cent pepperoni rolls at Gumby's Pizza. It was awesome. Like your stomach was miserable the next day, but that night while you're eating them, they were awesome. And we'd do it every single Tuesday night. Loved it. That was like our weekly ri ritual. And then one day, my roommate and I decided we were gonna go have lunch at Gumby's. And we got there, and I was disgusted. <laughs> if you own Gumby's, I'm sorry. <laughs> it was filthy. It was, it was nasty. It looked completely different. Why? Because it looked different in the light. You could see the filth. You could see the dark. I mean, some of you live in a house and the sun comes up in the east and it shines in your windows and you thought your house was clean until the light started shining. You see all the dust particles. You're like, oh gosh, I gotta get the vacuum cleaner, get the broom. Hey kids, I need your help. The house is filthy. That's okay. It exposes what's in the darkness. Don't be like the bugs who run back underneath the log once it's been pulled up in the middle of the forest. Stay in the light, let him expose the light. Let him heal it, let him make it right, let him make it new. I think that's what he's calling out for this woman. But did you see the response? Did you notice what she did? It says she leaves her water jug. Why? Because she didn't need that anymore. She wasn't gonna be thirsty for that water anymore. She had found the living water. And then what she does, she runs back to the city. And I think what we see here is we see condemnation flipped to celebration. Last fall was a tough football season for the Aggies. It just was. It was brutal, miserable. And I was thinking about this this week. You know, there's been a lot of talk in the news. The University of Texas and the University of Oklahoma are joining the SEC in 2025. And 
I was just reflecting and thinking about that. I honestly, like I'm an Aggie who loves the University of Texas A&M football game every year. Like I want it back. Um, I was at the last one that played and I'll never forget it. It still hurts my heart because <laughs> I was there and A&M was winning and I had my phone out and I was recording because it was fourth down and like 17 and Case McCoy was deep in Texas territory and we were about to win the game and I wanted to make sure I recorded the moment when we tackled Case McCoy and we won the game as we left the Big 12 and jumped into the promised land of the SEC. And man, I was ready for it. And all of a sudden he snaps the ball, the play starts to, uh, to, to transpire and like the field opens up like the Red Sea and Case McCoy begins to run faster than any Case McCoy could ever run. And he goes all the way into deep Texas A&M territory with like eight seconds left. And they have this guy who still kicks field goals really, really well for the Baltimore Ravens, Justin Tucker. I never liked that guy. <laughs> because he kicked the field goal to win the game the last time A&M and Texas would ever play. And I was devastated. I couldn't believe it. I'll never forget walking out of that stadium. I was so embarrassed. I'm like, man, I'm an Aggie. <laughs> and we just lost when we, there's no way we should have lost that game. And I'll never forget the Texas fans that were there. God, they're so obnoxious. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> Aggies are really obnoxious. But that night, I'm walking out and all the Texas fans are chanting, S-E-C, S-E-C, mocking every Aggie in their shame as they exit Kyle Field. And I was like, man, this is terrible. And then we began to look forward to the SEC. And every year, a and fans are notorious for this. Hey, you know what? It was a rough season, but next year, <laughs> next year, next year's the year. I mean, I've said it myself, and I still believe it. Next year. You know the one year I didn't believe it? That year. Because we were going to the SEC. We were going to get our teeth kicked in by the SEC, by the Georgias and the Alabamas and the Auburns and the LSUs. And I was just like, man, this is going to be terrible. But then there was this guy named Johnny Manziel, Johnny Football, who shows up at College Station, and he's just a freak of nature. His hands are like that big, his feet are like that big, and he can just do crazy things all over the football field and make everybody miss. And all of a sudden, the season starts to unwind and unravel, and I had expectations we were gonna be terrible. All of a sudden, we start beating teams we're not supposed to beat. And then we show up in Tuscaloosa, Alabama. We're playing the mighty Alabama Crimson Tide. The Aggies jump out and go up like 20 to zero. And I'm just terrified. I'm like, there's no way we're holding on to this lead. There's no way we're gonna win this game. And a &M wins the game. Go on and destroy OU and the Cotton Bowl. I mean, it was an unbelievable season. I truly believe a &M was the best team in college football year. I'm still bitter about the called penalty in the LSU game that kept us from being a one loss team and playing in the national championship. I'm working through it. I've got issues. Here's why I tell you that story. The night that a &M beat Alabama, I lost my mind. I did it again a couple years ago. I lost my mind. You know what nobody was doing the night that a and beat Alabama? Nobody was crying and whining and feeling shame because we had lost to Texas the year before. There was celebration. There was an overwhelming celebration that couldn't be stopped. And I think that's what you see in the life of this woman. Jesus shows up. What was it that this woman was doing around town? I'm not gonna describe it for you, there's children in the room. But did she have a reputation? Yes. Was it a good reputation? No. She meets Jesus in her uncertainty, in her doubt and her worth and her value, in the condemnation and shame she'd lived with for years. She meets Jesus and he flips the script of her life and he flips her uncertainty into clarity of who she is and who he wants to be for her. He flips the script of comparison and he completes her. And she begins to live in a transformation that only he can provide. He steps onto the scene and he takes and he flips her condemnation into the celebration. She runs back to the city, the city of shame. And she begins to tell everybody her story. And she's showing up. She's like, Jesus told me everything I ever did. And they're like, oh, we know. <laughs> we, we know about you. Hide your kids, hide your wife. <laughs> like, like, she shows up. She goes, no, 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 I got a story to tell. I don't even care about the shame anymore because I got something better. I've got something that matters more because Jesus had changed her life. She had trusted him. She had left her old life behind. And here's what's crazy. She begins to celebrate. How does she celebrate? By sharing her story. And it's a story that no one would ever wanna share. It 
accept that Jesus flipped the script of that story. And what, is, what happens? The story of shame becomes a story of celebration and an entire city meets Jesus as a result. And so maybe you sit here tonight and you're like, man, I'm not qualified to be used by God. Let me tell you what I see in the story, what I think is true for us is that when God begins to work in our lives and he gets a hold of our lives, he immediately works in us, but he also immediately begins to work through us. But we oftentimes, we take our insecurity and we say, you know what, there's no way I could be used from God, used by God like, like, like that person or like that person. We, we begin to let comparison jump back into our life. But the story shows me, you don't have to do anything to be qualified because he's already qualified you. On the cross, he said, it is finished, it is complete. There's nothing that you need to do. He just, she just begins to share her story. Listen, what God does in you is never just for you. So what would that mean for you? What would that mean for me? What would that mean for your family? What if the work that God wants to do in your life in 2023 is the work that he wants to use to do in your family in 2023? Dads, what if the work that God is doing in you right now is the work that he's gonna use to work in your kids? in your family, in the home dynamic? What if it's the work he's doing in you that he's gonna do work with in the workplace, on the team, in the school? What if God is working in you so that it can spill over to those around you? And you see this happen in this woman's life. Don't disqualify yourself. Jesus qualifies you. We see this in the story, this unnamed woman felt she wasn't even enough to go gather water with other people. She has an encounter with Jesus and it changes her life and it goes on to change an entire city. Like that's a pretty epic church story. Even more than that, 2,000 years later, here we are tonight talking about her story and her story is continuing to change the lives of people. That's incredible. That blows me. Like how does that even, how is that even possible? Jesus wants to do the same thing in and through every single one of us. If you'll let him, Jesus will flip that script, the script that you've been believing maybe your entire life. Let's pray.